the Breaking Defense All Domain Interview, made possible by our presenting sponsor, Parsons. What actionable progress uh, has ABMS, which is a whole lot of things stuck together, but what has it uh, made towards making JADC2 a reality? Can you give us not not how many apps you've created or you know the new coding, but things that actually do stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm sure many folks would argue that, uh, that I know, I know. software is the paradigm of the future. So uh, we, perhaps we can talk about that separately. Uh, but I but I like the I love the question actually because uh, you know I think even a, even a year ago or perhaps most of these conversations were certainly where ABMS and JADC2 were a year ago. All the conversations were about hey, what's going to fall from the sky right. in a big event in 2035 or 2040 maybe even 2050, depending on who you were talking to. Uh, and, and we all know that at digital speed, that is never gonna deliver what the warfighter actually needs. So the fact that we're actually able to have a conversation within 12 months of a program start uh, is that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and so I'm glad you asked it and should keep asking those kind of questions. Uh, and so there's there's two ways that I, that, that you should, we should think about answering that one. One is we should always have that eye towards the future. We have to be you know, humble and wise enough to recognize that technology is gonna mature in ways that we don't understand or can predict, especially in the digital age. Uh, and then the adversary is gonna both operate and then adopt technology that we also can't you know, perfectly predict. Therefore, the most important attribute that the system needs to have, and I think General Hyten has this exactly right, is we've got to be agile enough to be responsive. We can't lock something on a stone tablet and hope that it works seven to 10 years. So that's where it gets really practical for me, uh, which is that what we're looking for the, of the technologies and capabilities and then forcing them to go through these buzzsaw events that we call on-ramps to ensure that they don't just work with bubble gum and duct tape in single scenarios, but in fact work across a whole range of scenarios. Uh, so what's, what's real now? Um, there's gonna be some tech geek speak, I'm sorry, Colin, but, uh, but the-, the, the Our readers are used to it. The, the most important thing that, uh, that actually needs to get built first is the tech stack. Why do I say that? Because for a decade or so, you know, we've been sort of beating the table on where, where lightning bolts that aren't real, where's artificial intelligence, and why don't we have it in the system the way we want it? The problem is that we keep focusing you know, on that end state, which is a good end state and a desirable one, but we never resource or put the attention to deliver everything that has to be in place to lead up to that. So the, the big wins you know, so far are the fact that if, if data is that oil of conflict or the, or the lifeblood or the, the primary currency, depending on the analogy you prefer across the services, the, the most important thing is enabling that to move across the system and then make sense of it quickly. Uh, and so the big win so far is that we have a live infrastructure environment that includes cloud and platform. And this year we'll start to move that to the tactical edge uh, where you actually have a home for the data. So you actually need the data to have a place to go and to be able to interact with it and then move across a distributed network. And so the big win is actually having that at the unclass, secret, uh, elements of the secret releasable level for friends and, and partners, and then up to the SCI level, and then even higher classification in the, in the coming months. And what in, inside of that infrastructure, that tech stack, isn't, isn't just for software development, which we hear a lot about. Uh, and it's exciting, but, but what I'm really talking about is that war fighting digital tech stack to be able to interact and pull from the data, you know, when you need it, where you need it uh, for that operational side of the equation. And so we've got data inside of that infrastructure, uh, sensors are pushing data into it, um, decision nodes are pulling data from that. And then there's a whole bunch of software applications because that's typically where the humans interact with these, uh, these bits and bytes that are then pulling and making sense of that. Uh, and there's a whole other modernization effort that we have going on to be able to, to get away from uh, applications that are currently simply work only for a particular platform or a particular computer. And the operational end state here that we, we've actually already seen glimpses of uh, through the three on-ramps that occurred uh, this past fiscal year is what I would call putting C2 back in the hands of the warfighter. And, and what I mean is that for far too long, acquisition, technology, the commercial base has forced operational leaders to 
pick who is going to do what mission and have what responsibility simply because they happen to be in the right plane, tent, in the right room, in front of the right computer that happens to have it. And what we actually have done already is shown that at least at the secret level uh, back in September, we've, we've now enabled many locations that weren't designated as a C2 or an information exploitation location to take on additional roles because they've tapped into that uh, tech stack operational environment, the data that's available, and then the same common application environment to be used. And that's not gonna stop. It's gonna keep growing and expanding the sources that feed it the operators that use it, uh, and then the user experience that actually interacts and, when, and grows to trust or not trust the different algorithms that are inside of there. Um, so there are many different fronts that I would say that uh, both the Air Force and Space Force, as well as the other services, have, have not 10 or 20 years from now, but actually even right now, started to develop, demonstrate, and even begin to field uh, some certain capabilities. Excuse me, capability. Uh, one, one of the difficulties in covering all this is that there are so many different moving pieces. So, you know, there's software, there's cloud, uh, there, there are things made of metal, not many of them, but some. Uh, there are sensors. Can you give our readers some uh, feeling for how, say, an F-35 feeds into all of this, you know, without obviously breaching classification, but, you know, they've got uh, that amazing radar, they've got their Intel fusion engine, and they've got metal. So taking those things and reaching out to the rest of the force, how, how, are, what are some of the ways you found using the F-35 changes as you're building this? To, to your specific example of the F-35, so our, uh, you know, chief and past chiefs and others have described that as the as a quarterback of a joint penetrating team. Uh, now, it's both a, a data provider, or it could be, uh, if ABMS enabled, as well as an information consumer. Uh, so if you, if you take that uh, with all the capabilities that it has, what you want is the ability to be able to get that information out of the cockpit and to others who may be able to fuse a picture that's broader than that individual platform. And then for that platform to be able to ingest and understand information from the wide world of sensors from space to ground to maritime to air to be able to do that. Uh, how you do that, I think you well articulated in, in, the, in the question about all the moving parts. The, the way to not do it is to basically amalgamate everything you just said and turn it into one monolithic solution that, that solves every part of the equation. That's generally doomed to failure. Uh, we see that history repeat itself time and time again. So you're stuck with Lego blocks, which means it's harder to explain, but actually is the acquisition or development approach that uh, will succeed because it succeeds you know, commercially. So to follow through with your example, uh, we wanna get the information that's available inside of uh, a, an intelligence operations center, inside of uh, any ground station, inside of the, the DGS and the Air Force and enable the operator inside the pilot inside there to be able to take advantage of that, both, both as an individual, as well as the algorithms on board that are making uh, you know, different uh, choices make, you know, real uh, for the particular pilot there. So to do that, you've got to connect it. Uh, so one of the, the programs that we have going on inside of ABMS is to be able to serve as a connective tissue, uh, both in terms of language that's spoken, as well as sort of the pitch or the frequency, if you will, 